Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, just hilarious. DJ Envy had to step out, but we have a, a certified legend in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen her on uh, Night Court. You've seen her on The Upshaw. She has a one woman show called The Book of Marsha. Miss Marsha Warfield is here. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm blessed, black, and highly favored. All right. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing all right. You See, all, all three of us in red. I know we got I the know. memo. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's that's a, a good sign, you yeah. know, when everybody is like on, in sync without even trying. Yeah. That's right. As long as no yeah. Crips walking here, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've been working in the business since the seventies, and you got a, a you're celebrating your seventieth birthday this month. Yes. Wow. Mm. Yes. Do, do you do you feel like a a, a a legend? No, I feel like Marcia. I just you know I do take every day mm. as it comes, do the best I can, and hopefully be able to rest at night comfortably. Yeah. So uh, things are going well right now and I'm very uh, grateful for that and very uh, uh, happy with the way it's going in the second half of my career. Mm. Uh, but uh, no, I, legend is something I think they just say because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have a resume to back it up though. I don't, mm. don't know, you know, if you hang around Sooner or later, mm -hmm. you know, somebody will, will say you're a legend, but I appreciate it. You know, it's nice to be thought of, uh, well thought of yeah. by people. Uh, mm -hmm. who, you just let them say that. Who know better. Yeah, you know? okay. Well, it's not often that someone with, the, you know, your, you know, like you has longevity in this business and you still manage to stay booked and busy. You want three TV shows <laughs> right now. Yeah. Like, what keeps you going? Well, it's not just, you know, most people don't get a chance to have one successful career. I had one, took off for 20 years and came back and have done it again. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm most proud of that, of the fact that I could start all over again from scratch right. and then uh, make it work into my 70th year. Mm. Yeah. When, they, when they called you about the, the, the Night Court reboot, did, was that something you wanted to do? Did you jump at the chance to, to play Roz again? Or you just was like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't take gigs that I'm like, eh, I don't, I don't okay. know. <laughs> I know that's right. You know, I know unless there's a right. whole lot of money involved. I ain't, you know, I'm not putting myself through that. Yeah. I I liked Night Court. Night Court was good for me. It was mm -hmm. good to me. I, hopefully I was good to Night Court. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I, they uh, called me, I, it wasn't like I expected it because they they were going in a whole new direction. They're doing a whole different show, and I'm cool with that. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I wish you well. I hope it, it does for you uh, what it did for me. I told uh, Lacrita that as soon as I met her, I said, you know, this is your gig now. This is My time has passed as far as this is concerned, so you take this ball and run with it. Mm -hmm. I hope it does for you what it did for me. So when they called me, I was like, well, cool, you know, I, uh, I'm i happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed to uh, to snowball from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you know and see how cha how times have changed these days. How did you feel when you found out that Ross would be getting married to a woman in the season finale? Oh, I thought it was great. And yeah. I love the fact that it's not the point of the show. Mm -hmm. Right. The point of the show is that she's getting married. The fact that she's getting married to a woman is never mentioned, brought up, nothing. It's not a, a bone of contention at all. And that's a long way from where we started, mm -hmm. you know, from where uh, when I came out right. and my mother went to my mother. And I wasn't even coming out publicly. I was coming out to her. And she said, well, let's, you know, I, I understand, but just, mm -hmm. you know, don't come out as long as I'm alive. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's small thing to ask in the bigger problem mm -hmm. that it was growing up and everything. So I was like, cool. And But now we can have uh, uh, this character and not just representing uh, being a lesbian, but being a lesbian of age, of mm -hmm. color, mm -hmm. uh, marrying another woman so yeah. that people know there's, there's hope, you know, mm -hmm. there's hope for people uh, you don't just stop living because uh, you get another birthday, yeah. and uh, there's uh, you don't have to stop looking for love. You don't have to uh, stop having sex. You don't have to stop That's doing right. anything mm -hmm. just because you're old. So I like the way they handled it. When you, when your mother tells you something like that, how do you not feel suppressed though? You're like you're suppressing 
a huge part of yourself. Yeah. I've been suppressing a huge part of myself my whole life. Yeah. I mean, from birth. And and when the society says this is negative, this is bad, you know, people try to uh, insulate their children and help them because for them, they see it as one, a failure of their parenting. And mm. two, it's like a, the world is going to beat you up. So let's guide you along this way. So my whole life, They've been trying. Uh, they had been trying to shift me, you know, mm. over to the right side. It's like <laughs> the way they do left-handed kids, you know. Right. Back in the day, they would tie your hands behind your back. They would force you to use your right hand because left-handed is is sinful, uh, sinister. It mm. means left-handed in French. The, it's it was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And so they would let kids write with their left hand. So you had a lot of wow. converted right-handers whose minds, you know, when you're left-handed, your mind thinks left-handed. Mm -hmm. You know, they open books backwards. They they see things totally different. But then they had so this corrective thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because I'm left-handed. And I've opened the book the right way. No, but I've seen left-handed people open it the, yeah, the other the way other and way. go from the back to yeah. the, and it's not that they're reading from the back it's just that's how they see it yeah and different. so you it, they try to shift your whole mind and same thing when you see mm. your kids you know your kid is gay from birth you know the yeah. little boy cries whenever you put him in a blue something and he look i <laughs> love the pink <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> and they're like, no, you can't wear pink because you're a little boy. And he's like, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. And so they start shifting you away from who you are. So when when you come out and you're expecting the worst, you're expecting your parent to be uh, off offended and, and defensive and all kind of stuff. And some kids get put out of their houses. Some kids at yeah. 15, 16, their parents can't handle it. Well, all my mother asked was, you know, don't put it out in public. In the whole world scheme, that was a small thing in my mm. mind. It was like, Phew. well, at least she's not it's, disowning me. At least yeah. she's not condemning me. If they tied your hand behind your back for being left-handed, I don't, I don't want to know what they did to gay people back then. <laughs> okay. <Jesus. laughs> Jesus they just Christ. tell you you're different. Yeah. Yes, you're different. When, when you started playing back the character of Roz, did it feel like a... a continuation or a reintroduction? There's a little bit of both. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of time passed. So, uh, you know, Roz was, uh, uh, my goal at the time was, I had just done 911 mm -hmm. and playing Hen's mother, you know, with the short hair mm -hmm. and everything, it kind of established a look and for that character. So I wanted Roz to be more like she was back in the day with the haircut and stuff. So I got the wig and and uh, went in that direction. But, uh, yeah, we picked up Roz 30 years later, 40, however many years it's been, and uh, caught up with her life. And I got to meet her again, too. I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. you, know? um, you was on TV when being on TV meant something. Like, you, <laughs> like when, it, when it was like a real celebrity and, and being really famous. So how did playing Roz back then in the 80s change everything for you? Well, you know, back in the day, there were just there weren't as many opportunities. There mm -hmm. was only three channels, um, and cable was was new. Mm -hmm. Showtime and HBO were just about all the, the whole game, and so they didn't have as many. They didn't, there was no streaming. There was no, you know. And I tell people about like selfies and stuff. It's mm -hmm. like y'all got pictures of everything you do. We didn't have no pictures. We didn't have no. It was a big deal when somebody took a picture. Yeah. So the whole technology changed, and as the technology changed, the the opportunities to, opportunities expanded. Plus, uh, black people have and women have have pushed the boundaries so far away from where they were when I was a kid. There were no black people on the other. There were no shows like this. There was none of that yeah. uh, stuff. All of this stuff is new and it built up built up from the civil rights movement uh, through the black power movement into uh, more demands and more uh, Red Fox and mm. Bill Cosby and Flip Wilson saying we need representation behind the camera. Mm -hmm. I need somebody who knows my skin tones to yeah. do my makeup. I know people 
to do lighting and things who can understand how to light black people. Yeah. And so we need more managers and agents and stuff. And all those things started happening. And I was talking about it last night when Robin Harris said at the comedy store, because we used to wait for Paul Mooney not to show up Mm -hmm. so we could take his spot. (laughs) That was the only way we could get a spot at the comedy store. And Paul Mooney always showed up. Mm -hmm. And so Robin said, I can't do this no more, Marsha. I got to work. I got to do, I'm going, I'm going back home. And I said, you know, that's cool. But you know, the industry comes through here looking for talent. He said, I don't care. I'm going home. So he went back and worked all the clubs we worked, you know, to stay sharp but didn't have the same exposure. Well, when he went back and then he met Michael Williams and the the Comedy Act Theater became a thing, and now we have more black people behind the scenes. We have more black people coming out the mail room and becoming agents, and now they're, then we had the cable, uh, the cable weblets started Mm -hmm. WB, the whatever, and the uh, the Frog Network and all those things started happening. (laughs) And so now they're looking for talent. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to the comedy store on the way home uh, from the agency, these black uh, producers and managers and things could now go the other way Mm -hmm. and come back and find a talent pool of black talent. And a lot of those shows were were cast from that pool and it kind of all came together mm. uh, through the efforts of everybody along the way, but Keenan and, and Robin, uh, Robert Townsend doing, uh, doing uh, ho- ho- Hollywood Shuffle mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and independently saying, we're gonna make a movie and where are you gonna get some money to make a movie? <laughs> and they said, well, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it on our credit cards. We're gonna, somebody, we're gonna hustle it up. And they actually hustled it up and made a movie that stands up today. And so all of those things happened, you know, kind of organically and and followed the trends the, of the technology changes and took advantage of all of the opportunities that they made happen. Mm-hmm. And we just kept on going until now you have representation, you have, you know, the idea that you can watch TV 24 hours a day and only see black people is mind boggling to wow. <laughs> somebody who grew up with Ozzy and Harriet and yeah. and that kind of thing and leave it to Beaver. So mm. uh, I happened to be just come about in that time period where um, it was between, you know, when things were coming up. And I got lucky and uh, ended up on night court, and the rest is history. Wow. But I I love how, like, you get excited when you talk about, like, back then and stand-up and all of that. Is that still your first love? I love stand-up. Oh. That's my, I don't see myself as an actress, uh, mm-hmm. actor. I, I was reluctantly dragged into acting because I wanted to, to uh, say my piece. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a stand-up. I wanted to compete with the big boys. I wanted to... Uh, uh, do stand up, and so uh, learning how to do, how to act, and all that kind of stuff. I'd learned all of that on the job. I didn't know anything. I never took a, I took a class once, and they told me to get a book, and said, uh, you know, read the book. And I opened it up, and they said on the first page, the key to acting is to keep it simple. So I closed, closed the, book the book, and I. <laughs> <laughs> I never went back to the class. Yeah. And so I was uh, lucky enough to be on the show at a time. It was like the number four show in TV. Uh, mm-hmm. You had actors, John Larroquette getting uh, nominated every time he opened his mouth. He got nominated for an Emmy. So often he took his name out of contention. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there were Marky and, and these actors. And I, I told Harry, when I first got there, I'm like, I'm not an actor. I don't know how to do this. He said, I'm not either. I'm a magician. <laughs> wow. He said, we'll just watch them <laughs> and do right. what they do. And so uh, they made it easy for me, and I learned on the job. Uh, mm. This is a question for you know you and you know Jess Hilarious. She does stand up as well. Is and the I stage know. your safe space? No, it's not. Ain't nothing safe on stage when <laughs> you're out there. <laughs> you're out there by yourself, but. Um, 
the thing I think everybody has to keep in mind when you do stand up is you're doing you. It's all about you. Yeah. And the closer you are to who you really are, the better. You know, you're you uh we we uh come from a tradition where for years black people weren't allowed to be themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh especially well there were no very few black there was moms Mabley and that was it. But black men weren't uh, allowed to have facial hair. They weren't allowed to wear suits. Mm -hmm. They had to be characters and and play basically uh, uh, minstrels. Mm -hmm. And so in the 50s and 60s and people like um, like Dick Gregory and uh, Timmy Rogers and said, now we're going to do it different and we're going to be people. <laughs> and speak our minds. This was this was not allowed. You weren't allowed to trick white people intellectually. Mm. And so mm. to be yourself and to be close to who you are, you can't fail at being you. And so if you'd be the best you you can be, you're always going to succeed. Yeah. I like that. You, you said you can't. You say you can't trick white people. What do you say? White? You can't trick white people intellectually. That was yeah. against the law, and in the South, uh, that was dangerous. <laughs> mm. uh, Dick Gregory said after a show, um, the group of white men came in. He was he ordered a, a whole chicken, and uh, and these white men came up behind him and said, "Whatever you do to that chicken, we're going to do to you." So you should have ate the chicken's ass. No, he picked the oh chicken up God. and kissed it. And <laughs> 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 <So, laughs> <laughs> what? Happened? Yeah. So that was the climate, you know. And and again, he won by tricking the people for tricking them. Yeah, mm. it's amazing that you know they 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 we act like um like when it comes to entertainment. And I was, I'm gonna ask you about like roles that they've asked you to play. Have they ever asked you to to play a role that might have been pushing some sort of propaganda? Oh, all the time. Yeah, all the, I I refused. I came about in uh, black exploitation, mm -hmm. and uh, before black exploitation, I don't think there had been any roles for black women uh, where you where they didn't play a maid or a whore, mm -hmm. and most often a maid. And uh, even some of the classics that everybody loves, Imitation of Life and all this, yeah. she was the maid. And I said, I will never play a maid or a whore. Never, ever. And so when roles came up, and and the, the maid is, she has a heart of gold and she wins up and she ends up being, and she's a corpse, she comes to, but she's a maid. I said, if she's a maid, I'm not playing her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I turned down a lot of roles. And I think we have to start encouraging people. We have to lose the go along to get along mindset, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get back to the uh, to the kick ass, you know, yeah. mindset that, you know, you draw your own line in the sand and you you have the right to say no, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we don't always uh, feel that we have that kind of agency to say, man, I ain't doing that. Even if they make you feel bad for it, you know, like, because they will agents and you know it, it's even like happened to me like I I will say no like I was offered like three or four roles to play a crackhead you know and but these would have been my first roles and I don't I didn't want to do that and I remember meeting oh my god the guy that played um Eddie Kane he was on the set of Row I did a, a sitcom which was my first big role um for Fox but his name was Michael. Gosh, look it up. Yeah, Michael Rainey, I want to say, or something like that. But he played in the Five Heartbeats, and he was Eddie Kane. And I met him on set, and he told me, if you let them, they will keep casting you for roles that they want to see you portray. You know, not for, you know. And I just, I never, I grew up in Baltimore City. That's all I seen growing up. I didn't want to play that role. I'm not saying never, but that's not. They kept, that's my agents weird. kept bringing that to me. My manager kept bringing that to me. And I remember him saying, Michael Wright. Michael Wright, mm -hmm. sorry. Okay. I remember he was like, my manager, he was like, this is you. The scene opens, you're pissing behind a dumpster. Oh, Damn. come on, man. Yep, after you snorted right. a line. And I'm like, and he's like, I can just see you playing this. He don't know how insulting that was. Yeah. I fired him, but that was, that was very, I just couldn't believe he said, I see, when I first read this, I thought of you. 
I could see you playing this. I'm like, damn. <laughs> you know, we forget they work for us. Yeah. You don't work for your manager. And they, and they take the position that you do work for them yeah. and that you have to do what they say and you have to let them know, no, I'm the boss of me. Yeah. Like I said, do you. I'm doing me. I'm not doing what you see. Yeah. Me ass. So, no, that ain't going to work. I, 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 are you having fun? Yeah, I'm having a ball. You, know? <laughs> you can't here. tell. I, I believe she You is. know, I walked in here and the whole room is orange and red and everything. So, yes. you know, this is the way it's meant to be. I'm I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about your uh, one woman show, the, the, the Book of Marsha. People always told me that I should write a book. And I'm like, I'm not a writer. I'm a stand up. So if you want to know my story, you have to come see me do stand up. Ah, <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you better than I can write it down. And I didn't want to go through the ghostwriter thing and have somebody else write my story, and I, I approve it. So, I uh, it's a kind of autobiographical stand-up. I um, mm -hmm. grew up on R and B. I'm a big R and B fan. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my thing. And so I sing a lot, <laughs> and I mm -hmm. you know I'm not a singer, but I have music in the show. You know how uh, you know how you have a party, and whenever mm -hmm. we have a party. Um, there's always music playing, but at about 10 o'clock or so, that auntie comes in and say, okay, that's enough of that bang, bang noise. Let's mm -hmm. put on some music, <laughs> play my record. And everybody goes, what's a record? And she don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't get smart with me, boy, and play my record. And so I'm that auntie. Mm -hmm. And this show is, uh, it's where I get to like, it's like a, a theatrical show, but it's like coming into my kitchen. You know, she always takes her place in the kitchen, mm -hmm. that auntie, and starts talking about everybody else's food that's and stuff. Right. Yep. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that, so that's the way the show hopefully feels like you've mm -hmm. come into my party uh, at the time where it was down now to the real people and not just the people you have to be fake with. Mm -hmm. who, who helped you on the, on the come up? Everybody. 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 Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. first night I went to the comedy store. Well, the first night I went to do stand-up, it was because Tom Dreesen had just started a, a open mic night. We'd never had one in Chicago. And he had just started open mic night after he broke up with Tim Reed. And they had a Tim and Tom comedy team. And uh, so that's when I met a bunch of people who um, helped me along in my career. Mm -hmm. Brad Sanders, who used to do um, um, the It's Your World. It's Your World okay. radio show. And uh, he's done a lot of movies in the Hollywood Shuffle and stuff. And uh, Tom Treason and a whole bunch of other people helped me along. And I stayed in Chicago for a couple of years. And then the first night I got to the comedy store, uh, the first person I met was John Witherspoon. Mm. He was oh, at wow. the door. Oh, he played uh, he played tennis back then, so he had on tennis shorts mm. and uh, and had a sweater tied around his neck like a preppy dude. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he started talking. I'm like, "You're not from here." And he said, "No, I'm from Detroit." And so I'm, I'm from Chicago. He said, "I introduce you to people as they came in." And uh, one of the people he introduced me to was Paul Mooney. Mm. And I, he said, "This is Paul Mooney." I said, "Hey, Paul." He said, "Mr. Paul Mooney." And I said, yes, sir. And mm. so then uh, we hung out and then started talking. That's where I learned how to drink cognac because <laughs> I was, you know, young. I'm mm -hmm. 22. And so I'm still in the stage where I'm drinking fruity umbrella drinks or mm. I'm drinking or trying to drink like grown people. And I don't know for a while I was drinking scotch and milk. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He used to be tearing them club bathrooms up. It was nasty. <laughs> nasty. It was nasty. But he was drinking this this drinking. Back then they used to light your your cognac first. Mm. And so they you know, burn and warm it up. And they learned that you were burning all the alcohol off and so Jesus. stopped doing that. But <laughs> uh, it always came with a flourish, you know, and I was like intrigued. And he was drinking out of the snifter and and what is that? He's is what he said, this is the stuff Massa wouldn't let us have. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's free, always get the cognac. Mm. So I started drinking cognac. And um, from that point on, he got us all on the Richard Pryor show. 
um, where we all got our union cards and everything. And then as time went on, he would help people get gigs whenever he was in, you know, he would recommend me. And then when I got my talk show, I hired him as the as the head writer. And so we went back and wow. forth, uh, collaborated. And that's one thing I just want to say. We talk about how we don't stick together. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that comes from. It's mm -hmm. like you, you, some people will come in here with everybody in their family, a whole posse full of people following behind them. We don't, and stick, together. We don't stick together. I'm <laughs> like, well, who are they? <laughs> And they're helping you. And I, I signed him to my label. I got a deal, and I signed that per girl over there. And it's we all stand on each other's shoulders, and yeah. we all stand side to side. And That's people right. have always helped and opened doors. And did you go and check out this so and so? They got a gig over there. It's not right for me, but that might work for you. Mm. And that kind of networking and everything is what made that kind of uh, progress I was talking yeah. about earlier happened. So we do stick together and we have to change the narrative. It's not like you change the facts, but when other people tell your story and then you uh, uh, internalize it, now you're saying things that ain't true while you're living your own truth. Yeah. So we have to start telling those truths and we stick together real good. Yeah. And, uh, and I've never had any... Uh, any situation when I came back, Wanda Sykes and Kim Whitley mm. and, and Adele Gibbons oh, and there's so good. many others uh, helped me in all kinds of ways, gave me gigs and, and uh, it just helped me out. I, I, I am passionate about how uh, dependent we are on each other and how we come through for each other. So yeah. uh, we need to change those those narratives, they're just lies. No, you're right. Yeah, it's just for us not to forget when we get in those positions because it feel like y'all had a bunch of unwritten contracts. Like, when I get here, I'm gonna look out for you. When you here, you look out for me. Like, Well, you know, you're, you're kind of forced into that. At the mm -hmm. comedy store, like I said, everybody's waiting for a spot trying to get on and you're all together talking, sharing, uh, uh, you know, as yeah. a group. And so you're kind of forced into it. Mm -hmm. But then you're looking at people, like I said, who are making those demands, who are making changes, who are who are opening doors, unions that were closed. And if you weren't related to somebody, you didn't get in certain unions. Mm -hmm. Well, they said, no, that doesn't work. And let's let's open these things up. And they fought for these opportunities that we, you know, walked into. So mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's been tradition all along, mm. uh, but we don't, we've never had the opportunity to tell those stories, and mm. now we do, and we can tell them from a different perspective. You don't change the facts, but you change the perspective. You know, uh, something can happen if we all watch an uh, accident happen. We all saw something different from our wherever we yeah. were, and if we're only hearing the side of the, the driver or yeah. the victim or the whatever, you, you get a distorted view. And when we start telling those truths, then people start thinking in a different way and maybe mm -hmm. have a, uh, a different understanding of what went on. Yeah, I think people like the most so focused on who didn't help them and who didn't. Like, okay, well, they could have opened the door, but it's a whole list of people who have, yes. you know. And like you said, your family, you got to focus on, like, how you got here instead of where you wanted to get because this person didn't put you there. So I, I, that speaks to everything that, especially the, the world of comedy now yeah, that we're in and all the trajectory and everything. But I loved meeting you. Yeah, and um, you. I know you got to go. One last question. Is there anything on your bucket list career, like that you, for your career that you want to do that you haven't done yet? I'm a, my uh, one woman show, The Book of Marsha, I want to do, uh, as a as a one woman show and have that be a special. Yeah. I'm working to make that happen in the future. And then from there, I'm like I'm just grateful for every opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been blessed more than I uh, have always uh, appreciated. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in the struggle and trying to make it, you think nothing's happening. But when you look back on it, it's like, dang, mm -hmm. I was doing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so. Uh, I just want to keep on growing. You know, yeah. I don't want to grow old uh, gracefully. 
Mm. I don't want to grow old badassedly and just that's kick, right. That's <laughs> right. Kick it, you know, kick the door in and keep on living until can't live no more. That's mm. right. Ms. Warfield, it was a pleasure. We could sit here and talk yes. to you for hours. Thank you for your wisdom. Yes, right. Uh, thank you for coming. It's Marsha Warfield. It's The Breakfast Club. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.